Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Mindy Johnson. I am an author and historian, and it is my great honor and privilege to share with you an extraordinary gathering of remarkable artists and talent who contributed to one of the most landmark films of our time. It is a Toy Story, and we get to gather with an incredible array of remarkable women celebrating its 25th anniversary. It is the first feature-length computer animated movie ever made, and the first Disney Pixar uh, film coming together, a unique collaboration between these studios, a rare alignment, and one of the most successful and award-winning franchises in cinematic history launching some of the most favored characters that still stay with us today. We have a unique opportunity here with a stellar panel of artists to gathered for this incredible landmark film. And it is my unique honor uh, to introduce everyone from uh, this particular group. I'm going to uh, stop share and say hello to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's really great to see everyone. And we're gonna take an opportunity here to uh, get to know everybody uh, individually. And we'll start uh, from an alphabetical standpoint here. We'll work as a group, uh, but it's lovely to see. And we have everybody coming from points all over California. Uh, we have London. Uh, where else? We've got folks from all over, I think. So let's get together and uh, get underway with introducing everyone. So our first panelist today is Bonnie Arnold. Bonnie is one of Hollywood's most highly honored and successful producers. She served as producer executive at Pixar Studios, Disney Feature Animation, and DreamWorks Animation, where she was most recently the power behind the highly successful How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. Bonnie, you came to Toy Story uh, at a sort of an interesting time in your career. You had had a strong background in live action and then made the transition. Tell us about oh, Yeah, well, interestingly, I had just um, been the associate producer on the, ad the live action movie, The Addams Family. And um, when I met when I first met Peter Schneider, who was running Disney feature animation at the time, they were looking for producers. And he thought really my background on the Adams Family, which had a lot at that time was sort of the state of the art for effects work, although it was not CG. It was literally one of the last movies like that that was all um, practical, but mostly practical effects, some other type, but not CG. But he thought Toy Story, they thought Toy Story was going to be managed really like an effects film, basically. A lot of effects shots through the pipeline. And I think at the same time we were, we were underway, there was Jurassic Park, the first Jurassic Park movie, and Forrest Gump. And so there was a lot of conversation in Hollywood while we were doing Toy Story that like Jurassic Park had, I'm giving an example, like 75 effects shots. And... Uh, Forrest Gump had 50 effect shots. That was a big deal. But I, but you know what? Toy Story had 1,400 effect shots. Basically, every shot was an effect shot, yeah. and um, it had never really been done before. And as Julie is going to chime in later, we never that um, there was not a feature that had ever been cut on an Avid before. So we had a lot of um, you know ground to break. But anyway, back to the Peter Schneider thing. Um, I was interested. I had been an associate producer. I was looking for an opportunity to be a producer and he told me about Toy Story and I said, well, I'm interested if I can be a producer. <laughs> so um, he invited me to meet John Lasseter, who eventually invited me to come up and meet with Ed Catmull and Bill Reeves and Ralph Guggenheim and the gang at Pixar and um, kind of, you know, that's where it really started. That was in... Um, my first conversations with, with them were in um, around December, November and December of 91, 1991. And I started uh, my first event, I was telling Mindy earlier, was in, I think it was August of 92. I flew up to Chicago and um, to SIGGRAPH and Karen, uh, Karen was there. That's where I first met Karen Jackson. And um, we went to Marshall Fields. 
because everybody was at SIGGRAPH and I'd never been to Chicago or Marshall Field. So we went shopping, which kind of set the tone for the whole movie. <laughs> it was great. I still have that leather jacket, Bonnie. I do you really? You know. I do. <laughs> for the trip then. Well, it done. was great. Yeah, it was great. Anyway, it's great to be here. It's great to be here with this group. This is the first time that this group has gathered literally in 25 years. So mm, I'm no. just so excited to see everyone. And it's such an amazing group of women. And I, I love you all. It's just so good to be with you again. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. That's wonderful. Our next uh, panelist here is Sharon Callahan, who is a lighting supervisor on Toy Story, director of photography and lighting for Pixar Animation Studios today. She has an extensive career on most of the Pixar lineup from Toy Story on up through Finding Nemo and more and is currently director of photography on Disney Pixar's 2020 release Onward. Sharon, thanks so much. How, how did you come to this particular production? <laughs> well, I was working at Pacific Beauty Images doing mostly commercial work and some other stuff and I had always dreamed of working in a, on a feature film and I heard that Pixar was hiring for lighting artists and I kind of rode in on Graham Walter's coattails as he was coming over at the same time and that's kind of how I got my start. Not, and it, this would have been about what, 90, early 90? August of 94 was when I joined. Okay, very good, thank you. Our next panel. And I remember your interview. Because we made you come up like you had worked a whole day and then you drove all the way up and it was like eight o'clock at night and you were so tired and you were just so charming and tired at the same time and everybody was kind of smitten. Well, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Jill Colton uh, is a, was a story artist and animator on, on the film writer and director of Abominable 2019's hit, animated hit. She's a director behind Open Season, an executive producer on Open Season 2, and, and also worked in development on Hotel Transylvania. She's the head of, toy, of story development and original story ideas on Monsters, Inc., and the designer behind the beloved Jesse character in Toy Story 2. <laughs> Jill, it's so great to have you here. What brought you to the production? Well, interestingly enough, I'm part of, I went to California Institute of the Arts and Pixar has a huge history of this CalArts brat pack, if you will. Um, and I was 23 years old. My dream was to be a 2D hand-drawn animator for Disney. So I was in the midst of getting my portfolio together to apply for Disney where I had been um, an intern and out of the blue I got a phone call from Pete Doctor who was a really good friend of mine at school and he said hey Jill we're gonna do a feature film up here at Pixar which Pixar was just a um, commercial studio really back then and he said we're looking for 12 animators to all start on the same day and I said, Pete, you know, I, I know nothing about computers. And he said, that's okay, we'll teach you. <laughs> Little did I know that, you know, our first day of becoming animators, all 12 of us, they wheeled out a chalkboard and said, you know, okay, everyone, today we're learning Unix. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that, that was kind of the pioneering beginning of, um, of being an animator there at, uh, at Pixar, it was it was crazy. It was rough, and and uh, the software was was not fully formed. But it was exciting times. I know we'll get into that more. But um, you know, really, what brought me up there was Pete's enthusiasm, and um, which was you know continues to this day uh, at Pixar. And I was just so grateful to have an opportunity to move up to San Francisco and work with a bunch of my friends from Cal Arts. It was quite an adventure. What a great way to start your career. Not, not bad at all. <laughs> Thank you. Our next panel is Karen Robert Jackson. She's a production supervisor on the film. In 1991, was producing at Pixar uh, for the commercial animation division. And produced award-winning commercials for global clients and accounts at the time. And then this idea came along for a feature length film. She went on to produce the highly su successful follow-up Toy Story 2 and has raised two sons and is now an organizational leader in health plan business, technology, and a unique combination of business and technology uh, on the healthcare front. Karen, it is such a joy to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. What brought you Thanks. this idea? You were already at Pixar, but 
what was going on when this idea of a feature length film came along? Well, actually I joined Pixar at an interesting time. Um, uh, had Pixar started um, demoing uh, their animation capabilities through um, some of the short films. And from the short films, they moved on to commercials. And so the commercial clients were paying the bills, keeping the lights on while development was in progress for the feature film. And so I joined uh, the team as producer for the um, commercial projects. And we you know, kept working really hard as uh, lots of negotiations were taking place, um, getting the ideas together, bringing in the crew and uh, getting ready to start feature film production. So at a certain point in time, I think it was around 90, Three. I joined Pixar in 91, and I think in about 93, I transitioned to the feature film project. All right, well, we'll talk more about what was going on at that time, so thank you. Tia Cratter, it is a lead CG painter on the film, was, is Pixar's, Pixar's manager of art and film education and works to expand the artistry of Pixar films. She was a shadow art director at Pixar and responsible for color and texture direction on many of the Pixar classics. A background painter at Disney Feature Animation from 1980 to 1994 on many classics, including From the Little Mermaid on up to Tron and many others. And also had the additional title of imperfectionist on the film. So I'm gonna let you explain that one shortly, but welcome Tia, what, what got you onto this production? <laughs> Well, as you mentioned, I started out as a background painter down at Disney in the 80s. And there was a young man at the time, an animator, who uh, saw, was inspired by Tron. His name was John Lasseter, and he wanted to do a little short film based on computer animation. So he did this little tiny short based on where the wild things are. And I helped him with that. So when he moved up to Pixar uh, and started doing the short films that won some awards, I had subsequently moved up to the Bay Area. And he said, why don't you come work on this film I'm working on? And I said, I don't even own a computer. I don't know how they work. And like you, Jill, he goes, well, that's okay. We'll give you a job anyway. Originally, I didn't feel like I should get a paycheck because I didn't know how to use a computer. So in 92, I started coming into Pixar. I would call Karen and say, is Gertie free? And if Gertie, the computer was free, I would come in and volunteer practice painting, and then go home. Uh, it took me three days to find the bathroom. Thank you to Deirdre for pointing that out to me. And um, I've been there ever since. Well, uh, even though it might have seemed easy, you certainly had to be there with loads of talent to get in, I'm sure, even at the earliest days. So oh, wonderful have you here Tia thank you thank you great and moving on to our next uh incredible talent here Julie McDonald Julie uh, was the editorial manager and camera manager on the film currently is managing director for feature films at zero uh, visual effects in Boston former producer of visual effects for numerous films at Netflix and other platforms, a leader in cloud-based computing. And Julie is known for her feature film visual effects and animation uh, executive management operation and production leadership, as well as technical expertise. So Julie, thank you for being here and talk a little bit about what brought you to the production. Yeah, so um, I think just to set some context for that time for filmmaking, at that time in the early 90s, late 80s, you had the coming together of computer technology, rendering tools were just being invented. I came to this space through um, the scientific community. I had been working for NASA and JPL on some upper atmospheric graphical um, uh, projects. And 
interestingly, in the Bay Area, we had several film companies. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola's American Zoetrope was doing digital editorial, Salzant's Film Center, Center also. <clears throat> there were just a few companies that were handling the picture and editorial side digitally. So I was um, introduced to Pixar on a preview. Toy Story had been on a short hiatus as the story was being um, uh, evolved. And I came in as an assistant sound effects editor for Bob Randalls, who was the music editor at that time. And I created the sound effects, the temp sound effects for the scene where Woody pushes Buzz out the window. So you've got the swinging lamp and the globe and out the window. So it was really fun to create those sound effects using digital tools. Um, we were working in Sonic Solutions at that time. I remember being um, up several 24 hour cycles in a row. So whoever mentioned like happy but tired, people who can be calm and tired, I think that's the group that Bonnie pulled together. After that preview, which went really well, I just remember in a bit of a fog one day sitting at my editorial workstation and Bonnie coming in and saying, Julie, would you come talk to me in my office? And of course I thought, you know, uh oh. And she offered me this position to run these two departments. And I, without blinking an eye, just said, yes, <laughs> of course. So that was just the beginning. And it's really exciting to see this group of women here and to reflect on that intersection between technology creativity, art, and that multimodal intelligence that this group brings together, um, and also that, that happiness while we're really tired. So, um, <laughs> I'm really happy to see these people. I'm super emotional just to see these faces and grateful to Bonnie for hiring me. Oh, yeah. thank you. Those beautiful moments. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, so we will, we will definitely dive back more into that as we get um, on, into our production here. Next, our, uh, we're going to move on to Terry McQueen, who was the art manager at the studio for this production. A writer in the Bay Area, Terry contributed to the award-winning anthology She's Got This, essays on standing strong and moving on. A longtime production manager, lighting director and production resources manager for all artists studio-wide at Pixar. Uh, Terry currently lives in the Bay Area with her daughter Kate and is working on a memoir, a memoir of her late husband, who was a legendary Pixar anim animator, Glenn McQueen. Terry, thanks so much for joining us today. What Great. brought you to this production? Well, I wrote in on my husband's coattails, so that was <laughs> that's the end of that story. No, I was I had been working at um, PDI for about three years. Um, as a production manager and it was a much smaller scale. It was probably 35 or so people in the studio and we did commercial effects and broadcast effects and a little bit of animation. And Toy Story was the, you know, was the thing that was out there in the, in the planets that everyone wanted to go to. And in 1994, there was a little bit of a migration from PDI over to Pixar. Um, Sharon I'll, I'll already mentioned that and my husband Glenn um, went over in summer of 94 to work on the animation team and uh, we we lived in the South Bay in the Bay Area and he commuted every day 60 miles one way to get to the eight o'clock dailies in the morning um, never complaining once Bonnie never complaining once <laughs> and um, and over the holidays, I received a call from Karen Jackson um, to see if I wanted to be come on come on board to be the art manager um, of a very small art team. And apparently, this little group of artists didn't you know hadn't had a permanent leader all the way through. And I had pity on them and felt for them, <laughs> but, but I was nervous because I was in the middle of planning my wedding, which was just four months away. And I knew how unpredictable this film was already, but I knew it was, I knew it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And Karen, I'll never forget, you quoted me just very, three very simple words, life events happen. And I said, okay, well, movies and weddings can coexist. So I said, yes, I'd love to. And I joined in January of 95 and it was the best career move I ever made. 
best life move I ever made. And Terry, you're selling yourself a little bit short. We really wanted you. You weren't, it was not a two for one. Kind of, we really wanted you. We knew about Terry from PDI and her reputation. And I had, I think I had, um, spoke uh, at, it was a, a workshop or something down at PDI. And I had met you years before and always, you know, we were very happy to have you join the team. So there. Well, Glenn liked to be then. So. Well, also, yeah. I just want to add that um, just to, I know this panel's about women, but let's just put it out on the table right now that Toy Story 1 would not have gotten made without Glenn McQueen. Glenn McQueen yeah. animated 20 feet a week from the day he walked in the door. Everybody else was yeah. animating a foot a week, and mm -hmm. Glenn did 20 feet, and we mm -hmm. would have never gotten the movie done. I mean, Julie, Karen, everybody, tell you know, yeah, it's completely yeah. true. Yeah. It was just a yeah. witness. Yeah. We would have not made the movie without Glenn. We no. Not to say that we were uh, slaves to quotas, but when somebody, <laughs> <laughs> but it helps when you can get that movie made. And and yeah. Terry and I have shared a lot of life uh, life events and life experiences, and we miss Glenn and we love you, Terry. Yeah. Beezy and Treva, we all work. All of us work with Galen. We all work very closely with Glenn. He was he was a superstar. So. Here's just to say, you got to give credit where credit is due. And here's to Glenn McQueen. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Thank you guys. Most definitely. Thank you. Our next panelist here is Allison Murphy, who is a technical uh, department manager, lighting and rendering department manager, a pioneer in computer graphics in Canadian music and production. Allison is an Emmy award-winning visual effects producer for Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and the producer for Monsters, Inc. Highly successful career as an award-winning interior designer and currently lives with her family in the UK where she's managing the layout, lighting and generalist departments and visual production and stagecraft teams for the London studios of Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, an incredibly busy, very busy person. Allison, it's wonderful to have you here. What brought you to this production? Uh, I think it was just fate, actually. Um, I had crossed paths with John Lasseter for oh, a decade, I think, because we kind of traveled in the same circles, Seagraph, showing little animations, because I started out as a computer animator in like 1981. No, sorry. Yeah, 1981. It seems like a long time ago. I mean, most people weren't even born before then. Um, and I gradually worked my way through the computer animation and eventually got hired uh, by Lucasfilm um, in 1990. And I worked on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and I wasn't the, the producer for the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, I was the visual effects supervisor. Mm -hmm. So I had taken all of my uh, 2D skills and my actual hands-on 3D animations and model making and lighting skills and wrapped it into that job. And then I love that job a lot. Um, it was probably one of the best jobs I've ever had, but it was really grueling. And um, as luck would have it, I, I got pregnant and had a child and got married all at once while I was doing 20 hour um, days. And uh, I did that for the first two seasons of Young Indiana Jones. And then at the end of that, as I was grabbing my Emmy, I was like, a week overdue giving birth. And I thought, you know what, I'm done. I'm retiring from the industry. I'm gonna go home and raise my child. And uh, uh, three months later, as you know, I like to stay busy. Um, I wasn't busy enough with a, a three month old and a friend of mine, Rose Dagnan called me and she said, you know, there's this studio, uh, Pixar is looking for somebody with your skills. Uh, if you're interested, they're hiring, they need some help. And I said, sure, you know, I'll go talk to, I'll go talk to him, but I've just had a baby. I'm not really sure. You know how it is, kind of that fog of childbirth where you can't even put a sentence together. And I took my demo reel. I didn't know what they needed, actually. I went in and I interviewed with, uh, I think it was Bill Reeves and John Lasseter. Sorry, Bonnie, if you were in that, I don't remember. I think it was just Bill, La or Bill Reeves and John Lasseter and uh, didn't even look at my demo reel, which kind of floored me. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. And they just said, yeah, you'll do. Like, okay. And that's when I found out that I would be um, managing the technical directors, which was basically what I'd been doing all my life. 
And they were some of the most talented, intellectually brilliant uh, gentlemen I've ever met. I mean, the there were the top individuals like Bill and Evan and Tom Porter. And I, I, I mean, they're just geniuses. But then when you add to it all, all the women that were in that same group, like we have here, Galen and Tia, um, and I know there's others that I'm not mentioning, but it was just really extraordinary what we put together and, and what we got done. And, uh, um, you know, there's a couple of people sitting on this panel today that I, I definitely couldn't have have existed in, in Toy Story without. And that top number one is Deidre, who basically saved my life every single day. Um, she probably doesn't know that, but um, I do not do Excel spreadsheets. She does. Miss uh, Catherine Serafian does. She's like the queen of spreadsheets because I was more of the artsy, like put it together, it looks good kind of mode. But those two women are extraordinary people. And I... I owe them many, many thanks. Allison, when did you come on? I forgot. What? When was um, I started in uh, January 1994. So my daughter was three months old. It was it was an interesting time. <laughs> mm. You know, as those things go. But it was it was just as you guys were coming off of the hiatus and uh, starting to crew up. All right. Well, uh, we will get into those details soon. So thank you. Um, our panelists that I want to move to now is BZ Petrov is a layout manager and animation manager and story manager for Toy Story. Currently the director of administration and human resources for Internet Archives, one of the coolest things on the internet. Uh, universal access to all knowledge for all historians. As a historian, it's awesome. Human resources and recruitment professional within a wide range of industries. She has worked as director of shared resources at Lucas Arts and head of production at uh, animation studios Wild Brain and visual effects producer at Tippett Studios on the Oscar nominated film Hollow Man. BZ, it's wonderful to have you here. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to Toy Story. So uh, good morning, everybody. And, and Mindy, thank you so much for setting up this panel. It's just so wonderful to see all the gals and everything. Um, you know, I was a mother of two um, and uh, was in the live action um, uh, world at the time, uh, working on music videos and commercials and all that kind of stuff. And the last... Um, you know, I, I, it was just so hectic, you know, uh, doing live action. So I was looking for a cover set, as they call it, you know, something that was indoors, that was safe, that might have regular hours, maybe a 50 or a 60 hour a week instead of the, the live action 80 or 90 hour a week. And so uh, Karen, who I worked with at uh, Colossal Pictures, um, uh, called me in for an interview and I was interviewed and I was actually turned away. Uh, because I'm actually well known for being uh, bossy, which now I think we should be calling commanding. But <laughs> um, and because uh, I failed a question, which was, would you page people on the intercom if you needed them to get to a meeting? And I said, of course I would. And that failed. Next. But um, then a month later, um, they, they, they brought somebody else in, that person didn't work out and they called me back in and they hired me. Um, I started on uh, September the 21st, 1993. It was my daughter's first birthday. I had two children uh, under the age of three when I started. So it was hectic. I don't remember much about my experience on Toy Story uh, because it was just jamming from one event to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, but I did have a wonderful experience uh, working. You were the first one, excuse me. Weren't you, you were the, Karen, wasn't she the first like production person that we hired basically from outside? I think so. I think, yeah. so. I, think and, I was. And, I think yeah. so. And several of us have big, really big grins on our faces because VZ <laughs> was the heartbeat. And I'll never forget on my <laughs> first day, you said, I'm so glad you have a pager. 
because I used to wear a pager because we did it in live action. <laughs> I thought, she's the only one who knows what a pager well, is. That's I a thought, whole, thing. The whole communication is a big panel in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Deirdre yeah. will tell you, I had to lay in the floor and kick and scream just to get an intercom to keep Deirdre from having to run down the hall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the phone. I mean, literally. Oh, yeah. Pixar changed a lot and had to change and was reluctant to change for a while and drag was dragged into change. Yeah. I, I I, my favorite, I have to just tell my favorite quick busy story of one of the first times that we had to work on a Saturday, the story department to make a screening. It was unheard of. Nobody worked on Saturday, but you know, Karen and I held hands and said the story department is working on Saturday. BZ was managing them. She came in with her children and I think a vat of macaroni and cheese because we didn't, we had no money to get any food for anybody. <laughs> we didn't think of that. We just, everybody show up, work Saturday, but BZ was just amazing and try, and catered it with like some hope. BZ, what you, I think you brought macaroni and, in my head. You brought like a, some macaroni and cheese, your kids with a box of crayons and everybody proceeded to do their work. <laughs> Yes, and I will give everyone the mac and cheese recipe at the end of this um, uh, session because it, it is world renowned for being fat. Uh, if it energized this talented team and fueled them, we want the recipe. That's awesome. Thank you. And moving on now to Catherine Serafin. Um, Serafinian is the production schedule coordinator uh, on the film, currently senior VP of talent at Pixar Animation Studios overseeing development of Pixar's overall workforce, producer of Pixar's Academy Award-winning feature, Brave, and the Oscar-nominated short, Lifted. Uh, she was advanced through a wide range of senior level positions at Pixar, including Director of Marketing and Consumer Products and VP of Strategic Talent Planning. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. And what brought you to, to the production, to Pixar in general? Thank you. I'm so excited to see you all. And I just have to say, I think we're all thinking it. Sharon, your lighting is amazing. And I know it's supposed to be because of what you do, but <laughs> come on. <laughs> Way to bring it. Um, so uh, yeah, I was, um, the story is, I, I really, I, I look at almost everybody on this call either, you know, was part of hiring me, training me, or promoting me or career counseling me through the year. So this, this, this is the group that did it. Um, and uh, I have a lot of fun memories from that time. I was in, um, I had been at film school at UCLA when I first in, um, I was getting a master's and I was going to be a professor. And then I heard about Pixar through a visiting Pixarian. And it's so funny. I remember so much from that time, but I don't remember who visited from Pixar came and showed, um, some Pixar shorts. And I was like, I want to work there. It's in Richmond. I want to get out of LA. I want to go work there. And so I started sending resumes immediately. The receptionist said, to send two, one to Pixar shorts and one to Pixar features, attention Deidre Warren. So I'm like, okay. So I sent my resume to Deidre um, and uh, I did not get hired. Um, and I was distressed about that. Similar to BZ story, I ended up coming in for a different, you know, it came coming in later getting the no. Um, but uh, so I went and worked in video games briefly because I wanted to still get into computer entertainment. Similar to Julie, I had this um, interest in technology and also technology for entertainment. Um, I wasn't in super high tech, but I was I was into it. I was super inspired by uh, Jurassic Park in particular, which um, I know Bonnie mentioned also. So um, so I was working in video games and eventually I did get the call to come in and interview. And um, I didn't get it the first time and I was I went into this just vortex, the complete shame spiral. And like every lesson they tell you about, like, don't make up stories in your head, ask good questions. Uh, no, I made up every story in my head about why I didn't get hired and what I did wrong and blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, a couple months later, Karen called me and said, hey, I saved your resume from the last round. We can hire again. I'm like, what do you mean you can hire again? And they're like, it turns out there had been this sort of hiring pause based on the whatever Black Monday um, when the story was sort of paused for a complete regroup. And it maybe it wasn't that they didn't want me. It was that they couldn't really bring in anybody. And so I had spent, you know, months sort of in this vortex of negativity that really wasn't necessary. And uh, as it turned out, Karen was able to, she with Bonnie and Ralph uh, brought me in as Karen's assistant initially. And that was in November of 1994. Um, and it was everything from dry erase boards and changing quotas on the, on the boards to taking Polaroids of new employees because we were hiring quite a bit back then for the employee photo board. And at that point, a, a high tech improvement to that was moving from 
pinning them to putting magnets on the back of them and doing like magnetize, which was like, whoa, you know, when this group says the Pixar wasn't ready to change, it was like, magnets, what's happening? So um, yeah, a lot has changed since then. And then there were, and then there were the spreadsheets. So I know we'll get into that stuff more later, but that's how I came into it. We are definitely at the earliest beginnings of a great career. So thank you, Catherine. Galen, our next panelist here and uh, a talent to meet, Galen Sussman, a lighting supervisor on Toy Story, a long time per career at Pixar, advancing in a wide range of roles, including technical director, simulation and effects supervisor on Monsters, Inc., producer of Pixar's DVD promo department and bonus material content, a producer of Pixar's first ever TV specials, Toy Story of Terror, and Toy Story That Time Forgot, and currently is producing a forthcoming Pixar project. Galen, thanks so much for being here. And what got you started at Pixar? Oh, that was back in 90. Um, I was at SIGGRAPH. I, I had met um, a bunch of the Pixar people through the years and had become good friends with Eben Ostby. And we were at SIGGRAPH in Atlanta and um, there was a horrible rainstorm and everybody got stranded. And so he and I went to a bar and we designed a new computer animation system. We spent about six hours like outlining the entire system and figuring out who was gonna code what and split it all up. And at the end he said, you know, by the way, we're gonna start a commercial animation division. Do you wanna come and apply for a job? And that was that end of the animation system and I went and joined Pixar with Evan. Wow. And that was in 90. An incredible beginning and an, on an extensive and remarkable career. So but, Kay, but Galen, I have to say Galen, I think if the people that were there when I got there, Galen, it was just, I just remember it was you and this woman, an Israeli woman named Yael. Yes. Karen, remember her? Yeah. But there yeah, were only yeah, two yeah. women that were like yeah, working in, in like- as In technical. In, in technical anything. at all. Yeah. Everybody else yeah. was literally it was Karen and Deirdre and some assistants. I mean, there really wasn't, there weren't, Tia no, there was doing a little women. bit of, you know, learning, but I'm, they were really, it was just Galen and Yael. And they, and they it were was the, the boys tech. club. Was, it was the boys was club. All boys. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and the great thing is that, that my only other language is minimally Hebrew. And so whenever we wanted to talk about the guys, we did it in Hebrew. And and I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's great. Well, um, you ladies are, again are part of what helped to transform this industry and real tra trailblazers in many ways. So we will continue our um, our quick look at uh, meeting everyone here. Uh, I want to move on now to Treva Van Clark, who is uh, was the animation manager on Toy Story an integral to establishing the CG animation pipeline at PDI DreamWorks, a production manager for the Oscar-winning Shrek, Shrek 2 in Madagascar. She produced a number of commercials, TV spots, and THX animation for Lucasfilms, rigging, a CFX, and animation manager for Atomic Fiction Studios for numerous feature films and TV shows, currently a freelance animation VFX producer and on the leadership team for Women in Animation in the San Francisco Bay Area chapter. Treva, it's so wonderful to have you here. And with all that you have been doing through your career, was this the start of things for you at Pixar? Or had, tell us what got, brought you to, to Toy Story. I um, pretty much, I uh, had uh, gone to UCSD and went into, uh, was working in television news, wanted to move back up to the Bay Area had a very difficult time getting a job, breaking in um, to the news up here. Ended up working for a hardware company um, called Bull and Babbage. And when I was there, um, someone told me that they were hiring a receptionist at Pixar. And I knew Pixar um, because John's films showed at the La Jolla Playhouse. And so I said, sure, I'd love to go. So I actually ended up getting hired as a receptionist and uh, would see Karen every single day when Bonnie started talking to them every day. And at, I don't know, I was there a couple months, I guess. And Karen came up to me and she said, we need to get you off this desk. And, <laughs> and she kept on talking to me about it. And then Bonnie 
came up to me and said basically the same thing. Um, and they put me in the animation department as a coordinator. Uh, I was working with BZ. BZ had a lot on her plate. <laughs> um, and then eventually was promoted as the animation department manager. Well, what I love and what hearing all around is that the support and the um, camaraderie and balance between uh, advancing and, and in moving women upward. That's a, a lovely theme we need to continue to perpetuate. Um, and it's yeah, I think I was probably also one of the only people there who actually knew Unix as well. <laughs> Um, because I, it was back in the day where that's what I had to learn when I was in college. So I think that helped us slight bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And certainly not least by any means that I think the heart and soul of this production, Deirdre Warren, who uh, was the modeling and shading coordinator and production assistant on Toy Story, one of the original longtime members of Pixar Studios at Pixar's for 34 years, the second woman hired at Pixar. Uh, having worked on the short films and TV commercials, she was part of the Toy Story team and it was developed as a 30 minute TV special. A manager in the technical department for modeling and shading on A Bug's Life, Monsters Inc, Cars, Up, Brave, and Inside Out, Deidre, created a mentoring program for the feature film production staff at Pixar. And certainly I think the, the foundation of this group, Deidre, welcome. It's so lovely to have you here. What brought you to the very earliest days of Pixar? And give us a sense of what that was like. Well, I joined the Lucasfilm Computer Graphics Group in 1985. And that was the year before it became Pixar. Um, so I was there, I was in the right, you know, lucky being the, the right place at the right time. Um, so I was there for the uh, short films and then the commercials. Um, so, and then I just stayed and just bounced from, I was just there and I was there until last year. So it's been, I mean, I was there before some people here were born, I think, <laughs> probably, <laughs> or in grade school perhaps. Well, it's such a delight to have you all here. And Deirdre, you described this production as a kitchen table operation. And since it was the first of its kind, um, my sense is you guys were kind of building the plane as you were flying it, as it was taking off. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, as you were all coming on the production, I know there was a, um, a bit of a redirect. We, had, we mentioned briefly Black Monday uh, where there was a need to, to make some changes um, early on. But uh, once in production, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that you were all confronted with in your individual roles and then overall as a production? Well, I think it's all about story. Pixar is all about story. So we had a lot of challenges for story, uh, dealing with getting the story right, the characters right, and there were... You know, and we were working with Disney and they had a lot of comments. Um, and it, they came to a stage when, in fact, it was John and Joe and Andrew and Pete were not making the film, were being asked to make the film they didn't want to make. And so when this amazing Black Monday turned up, that's when I think the guys showed particular courage because they said, they didn't ever say we can't do it their eternal optimism was amazing. And they just, we can do it. They just got, got on and rewrote the story. And I think that continued through some of the other challenges. I mean, technically we had to dream every, well, do, you know, dream everything up, how to do all the technical challenges. And at, at, at any time they didn't ever say, we can't do it. There, it was always, we can do it. So it was always about, passion and incredible optimism and great camaraderie. And it was really astounding when you look back, but it was, I think someone, I think it was Lee Unkrich talked about being, being in the stone age, as far as technology was concerned, as even Bonnie said, Bonnie had to throw a hissy fit to get uh, 
you know, some intercom thing, because otherwise I was running up and down the corridors calling out, has anyone seen Ralph or where is so-and-so? It was really quite bizarre. But anyway, that was what the early days were like. And so I was, of course, there the year before it was Pixar, and I was very privileged to be part of the small computer graphics group, which became Pixar. And then, of course, that was 86. And then, of course, I was in there for the short films and then slid into the film. So I was just there. Mm -hmm. I, and one, I just have to chime in and say, I think one of the most difficult things and the people that were there when I first came, would, will, I think will attest to this, is that I think the biggest change had to be about their, the culture of Pixar. Because the first thing when I walked in, I said, they said, we don't want to be ILM. Everybody's running around there. I said, yeah, but they're making a movie. That's why it's so crazy over there. And I said, you'll see, it's not like working in a bank. We're going to make a movie and it's going to be crazy. And we're going to have to kind of figure out how to deal with it. So, <laughs> and we're going to work long hours and we're going to work on the weekend when we have to. And nobody, and you know, Deirdre and Karen will tell you, nobody that worked there wanted to kind of hear that. But I think everybody, as the story evolved and the elements started to come together, people got excited about it and got excited about what it could be. And, um, you know, that's what I think started to get, you know, motivating us. But I, but I think, you know, when I just, I want to clarify just because I feel like, you know, the, 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 this has been talked about so many times, but I feel like, and this is a testament to the people that are on this call is that yes, it's about story. Yes, it's important to have a good story, but a lot of good stories never get made. And or never get told. And the reason that that story, Toy Story, got told and got seen and got made was because a lot of the people in this call worked really hard to figure out how to put that story on, you know, get it on the screen, basically. And not just technically, but there's certain processes that we had to adopt. Disney showed us some things, not everything translated 100% to the way we were trying to do it. And we didn't have the people. I mean, for example, this group a lot, and there's a couple of, you know, there's Sharon's is in here and Galen's in here and, you know, some of the artists like Jill are, are in here, but a lot of the production people at Disney, they had three and four people for each department to help manage the process. We literally did it with the people that you're seeing here, the whole movie. <laughs> and we had to do it for a certain amount of money. And so Karen and I are in the room, you know, counting paper clips while everybody's kind of running around. You know, that's why we couldn't hire Catherine when we needed her, because, you know, we were really at the, you know, really trying to um, do it for a budget, which we really did quite well at the end of the day. So I just have to give that whole caveat of why we're why this group is so important and why I personally feel like we're the unsung heroes of getting that movie on the, you know, getting that movie delivered how we did. Um, and we actually did it on, you know, they decided when Disney finally realized what they had, we actually accelerated the delivery schedule by about four months. Didn't we, Karen? Wasn't it like four yeah. months earlier? Yeah, yeah it was crazy. Months, we were like running, you know, we were chasing our tail to get it out for Thanksgiving of 95. But anyway, I won't take over the whole thing, but I just want to. <laughs> and, you know, you bring up really great points, Bonnie. People don't realize we think of the series and the great franchise of all those wonderful films but at the time this was a tiny group of people who were branching out to do something that had never been done before in their immediate purview but also using technology that had never been applied to this forum before so there was a I it strikes me there was a lot of um blazing the trail as your you know, marching forward uh, at intense speed. Um, and as to your point, Bonnie, it sounds like when you arrived, people didn't quite fully understand what was ahead. They had, they had no idea. <laughs> we, <laughs> we were clueless. <laughs> we were totally clueless. I remember conversations, um, 93 maybe, when we were talking about doing this and saying, why do we need an editorial department? Because do, if you're just animating from shot to shot to shot, don't you just stream them together? Do we really need an editorial department? I mean, we were, we were literally clueless. Funny you should mention that, Galen. I was just gonna jump in and talk about when in live action you shoot something, you're constrained. 
because you've shot it, it's in the can, the lighting was the lighting that it was on that day, whether it's a short form or long form, you're constrained. And this was an environment where you had, the director had a huge appetite, the Disney had a huge appetite, each individual artist had a, an appetite. And this group of people here, we were, our mandate was to not control the appetite in terms of a repressive control, but to execute the appetite in such a way that the movie got made and that the right movie got made. And so the intersection of like requirements there that you're, you're dealing with directors, you're dealing with a, a modality where there's apparently infinite possibilities, but we know there aren't really, but there's that appetite that always wants to keep changing. And so that was really in the early, early days. So to Galen's point about why is there an editorial department? My main, one of my main memories is BZ and I running down that hallway in front of editorial, if the cut had changed and she'd be like, stop changing the cut. I'm like, I can't stop changing the cut. Okay, the cut's changed. Bonnie, the cut's changed. No, it hasn't. Yes. I mean, just the <laughs> incredible um, energy around that intersection of creativity, controlling the cut, making sure that it's workable and doable. That's exactly where we were, was right at the, in those crosshairs. And um, just being able to navigate the intensity around that. That's what I remember from the show is just that aggressive, productive collaboration, because it was kind of all the time. Um, it was a very, very unique period of time. Nowadays, people are much more accustomed to, uh, if you have something built uh, in visual effects or a model, then that actually sets the tone for what can come later. This was new. This was at the very beginning of that. People didn't, we were hiring people who didn't even know how to work on computers. I mean, it was like, we were hiring, we got into that crunch mode. And I remember Bonnie coming down and she's like, telling Pete and I, hire, you got to hire more people. We got to, we're moving up the schedule. You got to get this done. And we were hiring animators, like pull, ripping them out of CalArts, basically. It was like, you know, show us your short film, come. <laughs> and it's like, they're like, I've never worked on a computer. It was like, okay. And we would get them up and running like in months. I mean, it was unbelievable. Like the, the process of getting people who'd never even looked at a computer before, all of a sudden animating on a computer. And, and not only that, but then having to, produce footage which was crazy too but when I'll even jump on that because I was one of those people that didn't know how to animate on the computer and what was so crazy is before the big hire when it was just 12 animators working on that very first scene with the baby monitor and the army men which took us quite a while because we were kind of cutting our teeth on technology at the same time and what people don't realize is now you can walk into a computer animation studio and there's Maya straight out of the package or some sort of software. But the technical directors at Pixar at the time were creating the software as we were going. So one of my favorite memories was when a whole bunch of us 2D animators who had never worked on the computer and we were all almost under the age of 25, except for Bud Lucky, and we were sitting there going like, why can't it do this? Why can't we do squash and stretch? And there's these people with their doctorates and masters in computer science who had written this amazing groundbreaking software and we're just complaining all of the time. And so one of the funniest moments was John finally said, okay, this is it, we're gonna, we're gonna have this out. And so he got all the technical directors and all of the animators in a room and said, have at it. And we all just started complaining at each other. And one of my favorite things was that in the midst of us talking over the top of each other, John just kind of sat back in his chair and he just, he folded his arms like this and he got a big kind of Cheshire cat grin on his face. And everyone was looking at him like, what? And he said, you know what we're doing here? We're making history. That's what we're doing. We're making history right now. And I'll never forget that moment because he was right. He said, you know, we're never going to create software that's user friendly for artists if we don't clash on some level. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, he assigned a TD to each one of our desks and they would sit with us all day and watch us work and go, oh, that's why you need this. And the next morning you'd come in, start your computer up and the whole software would be different. If you're, there'd be new buttons, there'd be new bells and whistles. And that's how we progressed. And it's amazing. At that point, I would have thought, we're never gonna finish this movie. And it's the tenacity of the women on this panel and the people that were at Pixar at that time that kind of never gave up in the face of, oh my gosh, we don't even have totally working software yet. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough infrastructure. We don't have enough production people. It's amazing. It's a miracle, really. 
Well, and that's the, the point that I think a lot of people kind of need a refresher in that every aspect of this production was cutting edge, bleeding edge, if you will, um, from the technology being developed for every aspect of production to uh, first use of the AVID computer editing systems. Um, and to John's point that you guys were making history, how present was that in your minds going into the into work every day? I mean, was that kind of on your shoulder all the time? Or was it just let's just nose to the grindstone, let's get it done? What was the prevail? Yeah, and one of it is I think we were in a little bit of a bubble, I think, when we were working. Because I think I remember even at SIGGRAPH when I the, when I was telling the first thing I did when I met Karen and you know Ralph Guggenheim who was the uh, was the other producer along with me and he was saying, you know, this is going to be historic. This is the first thing. This is the first computer, all computer animated feature. And I kind of heard that, but <laughs> it, I guess when we were in the trench, it didn't really stick. I was telling, um, I was remembering and telling Mindy about the, I think, Karen, I don't remember exactly when this was, but we were, we had the only people that we really shared any of the movie with were a few executives at Disney for a long time. Yeah. It was yeah, uh, Peter true. Schneider and, um, I can't even remember if, um, I guess, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Jeffrey, Jeffrey was still oh, there. Yeah. Michael Eisner Schumacher. was uh, uh, Thomas I, I Schumacher. Saw, Thomas but Schumacher. I just remember we had this presentation. I want to say uh, it was Burger King. We had this big, there was a big deal, a presentation to Burger King. And that was the first time because they were going to do, they were thinking about doing the little toy giveaway when the movie came out. So they came up, Deirdre, you might remember, I mean, you guys might remember this, I don't know, whatever, but we had a presentation in our theater and they were the first people that actually saw some of the movie. I want to say this was, it was probably about a year before the movie came out, maybe. Um, this would have been like 94. I don't know why, fall maybe of 94. Yeah, but they, but they were blown away. And that was the first time, like slightly out of the bubble of somebody from the outside. And I think even Disney was floored by that. They just said, this is going to be groundbreaking and unbelievable. And that's when they, Disney went back in confab and changed our date, I think. <laughs> changed our release date. I even remember, do you, re do you guys remember that SIGGRAPH that we showed the baby monitor sequence, that first one? Yeah. That we heard. yeah. A lot of us were able to fly down because there were so few of us at the studio. And I remember sitting in that theater and watching that three and a half, four minute sequence play. It was the only thing we had completed. And the whole theater at SIGGRAPH was quiet. Mm -hmm. And it was quiet long enough for someone to lean over to me and say, we're fired, aren't we? <laughs> and, and then there was a standing ovation that lasted, it felt like forever. Everyone stood was up. That in, was that in August of 94? Yeah, I think so. It was right after we finished the first sequence and John flew a bunch of people down to that one cigarette and everyone stood up and applauded. And I just thought, oh my God, what just happened? And that was my first feeling like things are going to change and this actually could be something great. But as you said, Bonnie, we were in such a bubble. No one really saw. Nobody. Re I don't think a lot of people in day to day really realized what it, what really was going to, what it was going to, what, what it was going to be. We were so busy just trying to get it you know, kind of get it done. <laughs> I have to admit, I didn't get it until it was released. Uh, I had gone back to Chicago <laughs> to visit my family and they're like, well, let's see this thing that you worked on. And so we all went to the movies and that was the first time I had seen it and with normal people. And, um, and everybody was sitting in the theater watching it like it was a movie, like, huh. It's like, yeah. It <laughs> wow, I guess we did make a movie. I mean, it really hadn't clicked that we had made a movie until then. Sometimes you get a little too close to the canvas. Yeah. I don't think that any, I mean, like Bonnie said, we were so entrenched and it was such like, get it done, get it done, get it done, that like nobody ever bothered to look up. And it was, and Pixar was small back then, I mean, relatively. And so I don't think anybody had an idea how huge it was going to be. No one. I don't think Pete did. I mean, maybe John did, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we knew. Uh, well, certainly know. Mattel didn't know. No. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. A little different toy company took over for them. <laughs> you know, in breaking ground, sometimes it's, you know, there's such a high risk there, but um, 
again, the, the talents, the determination, the camaraderie, it's, it's evident here within this group. I wanna jump into some of the images that we have gathered. Uh, hopefully this might jog some, um, some of your memories and we can talk to these a little bit as we plod along. Uh, I know most people today know of the Pixar campus and, and its well-renowned logo, but it was actually in a small um, kind of office park that this film was created. Point uh, Richmond, home of the uh, Chevron refinery. I yeah. know, we 1001 West Cutting Boulevard, right gang? Yes, yes. <laughs> a great, great address. Yeah. It was the Chevron fires that would give us our big breaks from work. Oh, you go yeah. to the windows and watch the fire. Wow. At the hotel next door where I could put up the editors who were cutting all night long. Hotel <laughs> Mac. <laughs> oh, oh, Hotel Mac, that was so great. Remember Hidden City? Yeah. Oh, that was the yeah, best. Hidden like, City, I yes. That. And, and I City. Look, Little Louie's, right? Where we had a right. yeah. Yeah. Little Louie. Yeah. Three places to eat. What was the name of the bakery? Uh, well, it was Edibles. Uh, edibles? No, it wasn't Ed Edible. It was, it was that, it was another, it was a different one. And DJ used to get scones from there, like on Monday. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah. I should I I found that in my in my file. That's our seating oh, chart no. for the office. Isn't that great? Wow. <laughs> okay, oh, this is giving me trauma. I'm having this is like, <laughs> like, tri yeah. like a trigger yeah. warning right now. Like, oh no, no. PTSD. Like, wait a minute. Oh, so oh, don't even get that. closer. That's awesome. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the there's the bat cave. Yes, so we, bad cave. Remember all the scooter races where Tom Porter would race everybody down all the hallways? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's you and Bob. You see that? And there's I, my yeah, and Bob was yeah. so messy that we finally took blue tape and divided our room in half <laughs> so that you wouldn't mess up my part of the room. <laughs> that is so cool. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I found that in my files. I went through and see what I, what I have mostly papers, which I'm donating to the Academy, but oh, <laughs> oh, no. oh my God. I know there's me down. I see me down there. Karen, I think that's you. There's Ralph. Yeah, I was right across the hall from you. There's Deirdre. Um, that's what I'm telling you. Deirdre had to run around and talk, tell people the phone, there was a phone call. <laughs> oh, so man. kooky. Oh, really wow. Um, so, oh, okay. oh, hey. Hey. clearly we're a little further in production because there's artwork up, but um, yeah, lovely photo. Finished and, artwork. It, it's, it's finished. Yeah. Oh. 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 That's nice. So there's that reception desk, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was your base in the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so great. Oh, Lord. Oh, it's Tia. Tia. Oh, Tia. Bill. And Bill. And Bill. Nice. Look Catherine, at those computers. Those are, I love those look computers. That, look at that Apple II over there. I know. <laughs> look at that mouse. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. me and putting this all together, and I, you know, you'll see a lot of photos of people that can, but this is the first time in a production setting everybody has a computer. And mm. today that's standard. We don't even think about it. It's as standard as a desk and a chair and a telephone, but um, it really was groundbreaking at that time. Um, you know, when I put the call out for images, everything, it was another person at a computer and that's great. But it, it dawned on me then that this is, this is one of the first productions where that indeed the work was going to be at computers. Karen, look what I found in my, also my file. That's our, that was the flow chart. That's and great. Jimmy and guys, that yeah, was the, the production that was flow. The, that was we the, worked the on that. Yeah. And that was yeah. the production yes, chart. Yes. Oh my God. That's, it I, I recognize so those now. arrows. <laughs> Well, yeah. and if and the the last picture, if you go back, I think Tia is like marking up a script, and yeah. so she's got a is that a, she's got a script in her hand, and so that just also points to that integration mm -hmm. of dialogue and art, dialogue and art. So we really did cross over. Like normally, the art department might not be working so closely with this script, but in this not environment, all. everything yeah, was all happening right. all at once. So right. just those little details you see, it's like we all really internalized and owned the story. I think that's cool to see Tia on the script. Yeah. And what was so weird for me and anybody else here coming from a live action background of, of any sort, I, you know, and this went on into Toy Story 2. It's like, 
why isn't there a shooting script? You know, why aren't we working? <laughs> you know, Terry, I kept asking, is the script locked? Do we have a lock script? And yeah, that's right. And you guys just kept yeah. laughing at me. Like, I'm like, but we have to have a lock script so we know how many is, shots. That's right. Why is there a draft of the script? Yeah. Why are we? Yeah. And it kept changing. Yeah. Like, the Every script month. was latched. 30 hours okay, so do it the same way. Oh, oh, latched. oh Karen, I scary. Latched. I hate that word, latched. Oh, yeah. Latched. Scary. That is like five years. BZ, BZ, remember when, when BZ and Karen, remember when we when, when everybody thought that the layout was going to be done, but the whole layout, all Craig layout, good. the whole movie about Craig Good. One Craig person. Good. Can do it all. Yeah. <laughs> that was the largest. 1,500 shots. One guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the biggest underestimation of the whole thing, yeah. right, Karen? Yeah. Well, that yeah. Render oh, absolutely. And the yeah. render form. It has been um, 25 and years and people at Pixar are still asking um, when the script's going to be locked. So I will <laughs> say that. I know, right? I'm, I'm and, happy to hear that nothing ever changes. <laughs> But just to quickly also, I'm sorry I'm obsessed with this flow chart, but the, the reason I'm obsessed with it is that now working in visual effects, RenderMan, Pixar RenderMan has evolved such that if I want to get a, a, a first look on lighting, I don't have to wait till step whatever it is, you know, down here, like at the bottom. My, no, now our VFX artists are able to do these quick renders and it just, it helps so much. So everything just gets kind of compressed and has come into like the sense of the ever, the ever present which makes it hard to manage. But I just think it's so interesting to see how we didn't get to lighting till way later, which constrained the lighting team, which means that they had to be even more creative. And um, yeah, so it's just fascinating to go back and remember how this was dependent. It, it also constrained um, animation, Julie, because I don't know if you guys remember, but the render farm used all of our computers at a certain time of day. <laughs> yes. yes. So yes. The production oh load ramped up, we would be at our desks working and six o'clock would come or seven o'clock, whenever that magic hour was. And then suddenly your computer would shut off and start rendering. Oh, <laughs> and so yeah. there was not a big yes. back then. I forgot. Yeah. It's much power. I mean, we have more power in our cell phones than we do. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's absolutely right. The yeah. blessing back then, I think frames were taking, uh, Galen, maybe you remember like between two hours or maybe 20 hours of frame. Yeah. Which, which is like really fast right now. Yeah. I mean, we have frames that are a hundred hours of frame now. So Toy Story would have never been made if, if yeah, that I kind think of the, capacity the, needed to get through. I think the calculation is that we can now render Toy Story on our current render farm. We could render it much faster than it would take to play the whole film. Probably, yeah. <laughs> it's it's just unbelievable how that that changed that dynamic has changed over the years. Because I think we ended up having to go outside for some rendering, didn't we? Well, like, that uh, that was always the well, big we, uh, drama we, because I I can remember the conversation I had with you, Bonnie. That just oh, I looked inside the machine room and I said, "We don't have enough processors. <laughs> don't have enough processors." Always <laughs> <laughs> up against challenges. It's an interesting slice uh, and a look at that time period and to see where we've evolved from. Um, and again, looking at all these great offices, everybody has a computer, which was pretty unique. I have well, to say, my, my other thing is when I, when Deirdre, when I first came and Deirdre showed me my office, I was like, where is my typewriter? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> typewriter? Right, Deirdre? Yeah. I was like, I had such a fit about the typewriter and uh, Deirdre and Ralph laughed at me and said, we don't, we're not going to be using a typewriter here. <laughs> You're going to have to learn to use a computer. <laughs> And we also, with that flow chart, reminded me, Allison, remember, we would, um, you get, shots would get into lighting and then, you know, animation, of course, the animators would go back and start tweaking on their shots and she'd come running down the hall yelling at me going, why are they working on the shot? We're fighting it. It's, <laughs> it's rendering. <laughs> Don't <have to> stop. <laughs> oh, yeah. Aw, uh, Tia. Yeah more but but this is really um the start the beginning of contemporary production and uh so they're therefore very essential that's hilarious so uh some of the story team and now uh correct me who art. that's the art department. art team that's the art, that's Ralph, art. That's art department Aww. just and Bob Holly, Bob and Robin. Bob Holly and Robin and Terry and Tia the whole movie was mm -hmm. done by this group and yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll just quickly say that one thing that really has changed is, remember, we didn't even have 
uh, Google search. So anytime we needed to reference an image in the art department, we had to physically go out and take photographs or we would go to the Oakland library and look at their scrap file for reference. We've come a long, long way. Life has gotten, it actually has gotten a little easier now when we yeah. make our films, at least from an art department point of view. I remember Ralph and I for, um, for that scene in the Pizza Planet truck where everything's rolling around and the lights are driving each other around, taking turns lying on the back of a flatbed <laughs> truck taking <laughs> photos and trying to get a sense of like what would happen with the lighting and it was absolutely nauseating it was horrible but it was pretty fun <laughs> I also hats remember. off to ralph eggleston that's another yeah. person that i kept yeah. screaming really at disney awesome. I said, send me somebody that knows what they're doing up here with an art director <laughs> karen remember they wanted to hire this like book illustrator and they had never in the yeah yeah Bill Really yeah. talented, oh, but they right. never were really talented. But, and yeah, I said, no, no we got to have no. somebody that knows what they're doing. And got a girl. Good stop. job, Bonnie. We were blessed with Ralph Eggleston. Yeah, Ralph is <laughs> brilliant. Ralph is and, and to that point, you know, the reference, these were a couple of toys that I think were someone's uh, that they brought in. As I well. sent that in. Yes, yeah. Um, that's my daughter's baby doll that um, the art department used and uh, for that baby head on the spider legs in Sid's room. Oh, right. And uh, that's that's my wind up frog that I got when I was, I think I was five years old when I was very sick. My dad brought that home for me. And that was the inspiration for the wind the frog moment uh, for the escape out of Sid's room. <laughs> I still have that frog. <laughs> Good stuff. Love it. Being a dialogue editor, I just keep hearing that line. I mean, it's just, it gets in your head. Every, I think I could, there was a time when I could re recite the entire movie. Well, didn't we have t-shirts printed? Wind your own damn frog. <laughs> yes, yes. I still have my t-shirt. We have oh. for everything, remember? <laughs> I, I, do love the, I love these pictures. I yeah, love, no, I think computers, so it was lovely to see some hand-rendered work. Well, some of Tia's, this is interesting, but back then we were so naive I think that when Tia did these beautiful paintings by hand she was like well hey when the show is over you guys can have them just put your name on That's the back my yeah. name on the back of a few of your your drawings right back there. There. <laughs> they, there you go it, they didn't make them into my hands they made them into the wonderful archives of uh -huh. Disney yes. <laughs> to be you know live in history but literally we thought oh well you know maybe we can take some of this artwork home Tia and didn't you and Ralph do like all the kind of the color keys pretty much by, that you did them by hand right uh, Ralph did all the color keys. I would do these kind of color impressions because um, we felt that the technically we needed to show what the images should look like when they were on film. And at the time, this was faster than, well, Photoshop we didn't even use yet then. So um, back then, I think I probably did about 300, 400 paintings for the film. On Brave, by contrast, I probably did 20. Yeah, wow. And our technical workforce was really different back then. So when Tia's saying, you know, we'd big paint it the way it'll look on the film, to some extent, as I recall, and Terry, you'll remember as well, like we're trying to, you all were trying to get a blueprint almost, model packets and, and color. Everything was almost like, make it look like this because we're hired, many of the people hired in technologically were very good technicians, but but maybe hadn't been trained in the arts. And so that was the beginning of sort of Pixar University and a trend of hiring artistic technicians or technical artists as we call them now. But it wasn't always out of the gate the case that, that somebody might have a, a visual eye. And now we're in a place where there's a shorthand. It's like, I wanted to feel like this and you can have a technical artist, you know, these days who has, who has training in, in, in both sides of the brain as it were. And then just very, very quickly, I do want to say that Terry was a unique manager for the art department. Um, nowadays, world, our world of filmmaking is so asset based. And Terry was just a gem because we would do a painting or a drawing or a pastel and she would stop and look at it and love it and appreciate it for a piece of art. And uh, I I miss that. I miss that managerial slash art appreciation that Terry really, really brought to that particular film. 
you are so sweet. And that was such a delight for me. And I was so gobsmacked every single day by you guys. And I had never oh, been around, I had never been around this um, to this degree. And all of you guys, especially you, Tia, would welcome me, you know, into your offices and I could just, you would just let me watch you work and <laughs> you weren't bugged by me. And it was, yeah. you know, but because I was just absorbing and learning so much because I had, you know, I, I had so much to learn, um, but trying to keep in mind that, you know, I have to pull this out of your hands too and send it off to the next department. Um, and that was, you know, that was something that I had to develop over time, but I was very apologetic to you guys. But I, you know, we, there was so much positivity, I think just every, I mean, all of these pictures, just look at everybody's faces. Everybody's bright. Mm -hmm. and, and young. And young. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Look at that one. Yeah. Yeah. Scanning the photos, Galen, <laughs> or, or the sculptures, scanning the sculptures. Oh, like, oh spent God. hours and hours. For, no, it's been two days just drawing the lines, <laughs> right? Because that was the most important part was to make sure you got the lines in the right spot. It's crazy. So you were scanning to then be able to render within software, correct? Who right. did you, Yeah, basically. Yeah. Who, Sorry, who, go ahead. Who did the sculpture work? That sculpt, I don't know. Was that sculpt done by Jerome? There was Jerome. There was Norm DiCarlo. We had a couple of other outside. Terry, right. do you remember? Um, I, don't think, I wasn't there. I wasn't I here. I thought that was pretty early, Karen. I think, yeah, I think Bo was done by Jerome. For some reason, I remember that. Yeah, I think oh. so. I think it was. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> throwing throwing papers in the air. I, I tell you, that's a staged picture. That never <laughs> happened. Never. never. And clearly, it was not at the beginning of production. But no, that was that was at the end. I think at the end they were trying to get some other moments in production. Um, we had we had a lot of art, and I and I think Bonnie, you were talking about this earlier. Not enough appreciation for all of the tracking and the behind the scenes work that had to be, had to be done in order to just manage um, all of the different elements. And, you know, we had a great team working on that. And I think we, we do talk a lot about story. We do talk a lot about um, everything else, but kudos to our team of talented production women. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh. oh my God photo in there for you yeah Catherine there you are in the corner yeah. am I eat am I like that I'm the only one who's actually just eating instead of working <laughs> <laughs> Great. Like, Friend, some things never change you're always eating at your desk or in a meeting I, 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 God forbid you should eat at a table yeah it's the same idea there it is nothing's changed oh nothing's changed That's so beautiful Remember that warehouse, that warehouse area where all the, an that's like where the animators yeah. were. It's, it's yeah. yeah. Area. And, and remember we just, Disney people would come up and we, that would be the place they would tour them because it was the fun place because there was toys everywhere and all the animators decorated their spots. And I always, thought, I, always thought, I always thought cutting Boulevard mostly looked like a dentist's office, basically. <laughs> <laughs> From the outside. Yeah. yeah. Was that From the outside. Yeah. Is that where they were, the, the animators? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was like the bullpen kind of area mm -hmm. for the animators. Yeah, and Jason? We used to have a cutout uh, woody cardboard. Do you remember that, Terry? Terry and I used to share an office, and we used to have a cutout woody, and it was to measure. It was because we were um, the animators hated having to do the quotas, and so we would um, Pete and I like did this big woody, and we put the quotas up there and stuff. And then, of course, the animators quickly defiled it and drew yeah. a big <laughs> stain on it. <laughs> I remember that dream. <laughs> Remember that these um, yellow highlighter, so it would look like Woody had wet his pants. So yes, absolutely. Quality, quality fun. Clearly oh not. Yeah, guys, guys, look, I have a Rolodex on my desk. Yes, you do. I still have that in my files. Oh my god! Yeah. I love that picture of Bonnie. I want to just share a Bonnie memory if I can. Oh, sorry, sorry, Bonnie. Cover your ears. <laughs> Um, I you know, in an environment like that where there's so many changes and so many people from so many different backgrounds, <clears throat> we had to create a way of working together. And I just want to really call out Bonnie's capacity to 
keep the bar high for how we treated one another and how we spoke to each other. You could go into Bonnie's office and you could sit down and tell the worst story and she'd let you vent. She'd hear it all like, yes, yes, yes. I know this will happen. This is a John, Ralph, every, you know, whatever. And then at the end of the day, she would just kind of look at you and it was a bit of a like, and go back out there and finish now. And but so it wasn't heartless. It was just she kept the bar high. And so you had that lovely, um, you know, we, we looked up to her and she was just, um, I think to many of us for many, many years, Bonnie and I, we've stayed in touch. She's been a mentor to me, but just always coming back to that, like, what's the real takeaway here? What's the point of all of this? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how are we going to continue to maintain a standard of working together, vent as much as you want in private, but at the end of the day, get back out there, hold your head up high as a woman, as a young woman, and do your job. And I feel like I've thought a lot about what's, what can I say specifically about the leadership on this team. And I think as a woman now, when I'm trying just every day to lower barriers of entry to women and marginalized groups who need to work in this industry, who have a right and deserve to be here, I really take my cue from those memories of Bonnie always lowering the barrier to entry, but raising the bar of respect and insisting that we treat one another with respect and shutting down the sniping uh, expressions of, of unhappiness, and but at the same time, like protecting us and moving us forward. So Bonnie, I just want to say to you that my career and the standards that I bring to how I treat women, how I treat women older than me, younger than me, to the left and to the right, they're directly a result of your influence. And so I think this Thank is a great, because look at the, like she's carrying, like she's like, oh my God, on the phone. <laughs> I don't think we understood. Karen probably had a closer view of it, dear to as well the burden that you carried, the weight that was on your shoulders. And sometimes we were part of that weight, but you always turned it around and strengthened us and put, and put us back out on the floor. And I really appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. I hope this makes it into the final cut. Oh, that's <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I think we all, you know what, we all learned yeah. from each other. We really did. And I, I learned as much from you guys as I, I hope that you learned from me. And it was, uh, you know, I can't, I, I, you know, listen, I'm sure I'm looking at it with rose colored glasses to a certain Well, I will remind you of one time that I was lying under my desk with a migraine and you're like, Julie, what are you doing down there? Get up. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. Okay. Okay. I'm getting up. I'm getting up. It was, it was, it was, you know, listen, it was stressful, but I think you guys brought this unbelievable professionalism to the whole thing. And I don't have a lot of, you know, maybe I block some of it out, but I don't have a lot of bad memories of us not getting along. I mean, I think that, I think, you know, we all, and, and the guys included, to be honest, I mean, we all, everybody was working really as hard as they, as hard as they could. And it took, uh, it took some effort. So. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Look at Pete when he was a Guy's baby. So young. So young. <laughs> Very young. I love it. I love it but it gives you some idea of just the tight quarters and how uh, <laughs> the communication was. There was no social distancing. No. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, Darren, is this the, there's you and Galen. I love it. Is that the ACOM or the Sierra? I can't remember what we called it. I don't remember. <laughs> All I know is I was so pregnant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes oh. that's right. That's right. A lot of production, baby. I was really and here, uh, animation department. Team, yeah. What a great photo! Look yeah. at Jeff and Dave. I know, uh, and I remember as we, after one of the first few weeks, a bunch of us animators decided we would go out for a beer. And I'll never forget that uh, Doug Sweetland, who was prominent in that picture, um, so young looking, said, "I can't go with you. I'm not 21 yet." <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, do you remember we used to have, um, I was thinking about this the other day that, that we, um, the animators used to play video games and, but they started doing it like all the time. And so Pete and I had to, we were like mom and dad and we had to set hours for when you could play. So it was like, you could play between 12 and one and after six o'clock at night. <laughs> no, I completely remember that tree, but Earthworm Jim. A lot like, of, it was a lot of people's like like uh, Jill said and whatever. A lot of people's literally first job ever, right? First yeah. job ever. Yeah. First yeah. job ever. They had no knew no discipline of doing anything other than just being in school or doing you know. But we had you know we had a we had a we had a lot we had to do in a short amount of time. You know what's crazy though, Bonnie is it also reminds me that was 
it was one of the most challenging shows we sh we've all ever worked on. But at the same time, I remember having like bagels and scones in the morning and pizza Friday and people's families coming and me actually getting to know people's kids. It was small and intimate. And, and, you know, I've worked on productions since that didn't have any time for things like that. And yet I felt like on that first one, we all kind of got to know each other and each other's families. So we squeezed it in somehow. I don't know how, but I have fond memories of those social times. You know, we used to also remember we um, we would go the animation group. I remember we would go to like we would go to Skellington and we would look and see what they were doing, like on their you know a Nightmare for Christmas and everything. And then they would come and visit us. There was we were so open back then. We didn't even pay attention. Like we weren't like oh sign an NDA. It was just like oh sure come on over have a beer on Friday and see what we're working on. Well, they were a Disney show. That was um, Nightmare Before Christmas. Just to clarify, yeah. they were they were sort of ahead of us. So they were sort of outliers from the, you know, even they were sort of in a similar, somewhat similar situation. It was a Disney production, but they were based up in uh, San Francisco area. So we were we considered the fringe project, bit. Bonnie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fringe we were the, itself, we yes. were the fringe of the fringe. <laughs> 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 Definitely the fringe of the fringe. But I think, uh, I think to Jill's point though, like um, the, 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 you're know, getting to know families and all that kind of stuff. I remember feeling at the time, like these two things shouldn't go together. This, this sort of, very deep investment in uh, people's growth, people's you know development, and moving us along in our careers, and and let's get to know families. Like let's dig in all in for this thing because we're making a movie together. This feeling of community, big investment there. We should not agree with like what our most of our deal memos right said, which is like you're on for like one to two years. This is a one movie. There's nothing else. It's over after this. There was no multiple. You know, at the time most of us started, there was no multi picture deal. There was no promise of Toy Story being a success. It was really intended to be kind of a, a one and done. So it would feel like, you know, this is a fleeting blip on your life's radar, but it wasn't treated that way. Um, and I and I do echo uh, Julie's point about, you know, Bonnie and the, the tone you set from the top in terms of investment in each other's careers and career development. Like everybody on this call in some way, you know, did something to help somebody else along in this group. I mean, Karen, you said you actually hid my resume so that you could get me in later. You later told me like, I put it in a stack on my desk because I knew I would be able to get you later when when they opened up hiring. And um, I remember you coaching me so much. Uh, Treva, you trained me, you, you know, day one, you took me to lunch because Karen was um, at Disney for a meeting on my first day. And, um, you know, you know, Terry, also, you helped train me. Deidre, don't even get me started with all the training you gave me. And Julie, you gave me career coaching. And you said, you should talk to Allison uh, Smith-Murphy. And I'm like, oh, no, I couldn't. I was super intimidated by Allison. And so I set up like an appointment with her. And I wanted to learn about the technical departments. And, you know, the, just like Treva said, when, 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 when Karen said, we need to get you off this desk. Most of the people on this call gave some version of that to me. We want to get you out to that. You, you should be doing that, you know. And Allison, you you gave me all this advice, like, oh yeah, you could be more utilized if you this. I'm like, what's happening? There's so much support and, and a growth mindset for like, how can we get everybody to the next level? Career, knowledge, you know, development, professionalism, whatever. Um, and it just was so surprising since it felt like such a temporary place to be career-wise. So gratitude I to think, all. Yeah, I think the other thing was um, when, Mindy was asking me like who did what and I actually had to go myself on to IMDB Pro to relook at the credits to see I mean I have an idea what people did but exactly what was in there but you know we all had to wear so many hats you know because it was just there, the, I'm like you're almost yes there were other women I want to give kudos to how many women that were actually on the crew it's more than you would think but oh. this was kind of the core team there was such a small team that were kind of helping run a lot of what was going on and we all had to wear a lot of hats and you know, like I say, for everything from busy, you know, making the, you know, macaroni to, you know, I, I still say I would, you know, um, when I, after, after I did Toy Story, I went back to Disney to do Tarzan and people would say, what's the biggest difference about what your experience was on Toy Story? And then when you came to Disney to do Tarzan within the studio and I said, well, the biggest difference is I'm no longer getting calls about overflowing toilets. <laughs> because when you were on Cutting Boulevard, you would get calls. I, you know, the you know, me and Ralph would get calls about everything. You know, whether it was about the building or about production or about you know somebody needing food or you know whatever. So I think we were just all in it, in it, in it together. You know, doing a little bit of you know putting our fingers in every little hole and every little dam, no matter what we were doing. From what 
you know, Sharon was doing to what Terry was doing to what, you know, Karen's doing. We were just all plugging our little fingers in there just to make sure that we were getting to where we need to get when we need to get there. You know, there was roughly about 65 to 70. I think there might have been a little uh, people working on different roles, but I took a superficial count and roughly about 65 to 70 women working on the film. And um, it, it, my question to you, and we've got some artwork to look at and a few more photos. I know we're running a wee bit long. We lost, I believe, Galen, who had a meeting. But uh, my question to you is, in your previous work experience, was this one of the first environments where you had uh, more women that you were working with? Or what was the ratio like before you got to Toy Story? Super common for women to be in production management roles. Mm -hmm. So I will just say that um, typically you see it today as well. It's more rare to see men in production management roles. So for, I, for myself, I don't know if it was unusual to see women as producers. It's a very, very common role for us. And I think, to be completely honest, I'd love to see that change mm -hmm. a lot more. I, I feel like, but this, there were more women because there, I don't think there were any men in our in the group, in our particular, in this particular yeah, we had we had a few male PAs. We did, yeah. yes. Yeah, Jonas, remember? Jonas was my PA, and Lou, yeah. Luke, Luke was the office yeah. PA for a yeah. while. Luke, um, yeah, and Kevin, Jonas, Kevin Rear was the account. Kevin, and Joe. Yeah. 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 Oh. With Joe, remember Joe Murphy was the account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the accountant. Kevin yeah. worked for him. Okay, I will say him. that I told Jonas we were doing this today, and he said, "Do you want me to stop at Little Louie's and get everybody a turbo tuna?" Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and I said, "Yes, please deliver." Yes, please. I mean, I think Mindy, just to, to talk a little bit about the role of women. Some of us here on the call are pretty heavily involved with women in animation. Uh, Bonnie was previously a leader there. Treve is involved, and Jill and myself, and a few a few others. I think um, when we talk about the roles, the traditional roles of women and men, I think all of us are just still aching for things to change even more. Honestly, Women in Animation has an uh, initiative, which is 50-50 by, um, what is it, 2025? 2025, so, yeah. Yeah, so women uh, in directing uh, leadership roles, women have been in production, production management, certainly coordinators, PAs, and producers for a very long time. We're super good at multitasking. We're super good at smiling on top of the stress and strain. I would just love to see women in creative leadership roles, a lot more of them. Sharon certainly is, and Tia, you know, and, and Jill, you guys are um, just heart like mavericks in terms of that creative application of the female sensibility and i just um i just think more more it's, more more I, agree yeah. with you, <laughs> I think also it's interesting because pixar did feel um partially because it was small a bit like a balance but i remember out of those 12 animators that started on the first day myself and guillaume leroy were the two female animators. Mm -hmm. And if you think about two and 12, on my last film, we had 51 animators and four women. So we actually had a higher percentage on Toy Story than we even do now. We haven't made as much progress as we would have liked. Yeah. I know. So I, yes, I really, I feel you know, the it. Film, the film business story, lighting, we need more. The film and the animation, you know, yeah. animation were notoriously heavy, heavy, you know. Visual effects. On men. Visual effects. Visual effects. Deal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We had one female editor for a period of time. I, and uh, that's not easy. It's not easy to thrive in an environment that's uh, mostly male. Yeah. So I think that's, that's part of the hats off to this group as well. It yeah. could be one reason why we were as um, honest and productive and vulnerable with one another. I remember being, um, if I couldn't make a meeting, BZ would cover for me. If I couldn't, you know, if, if somebody else couldn't do something, Catherine, Karen, we would all, um, those are the people who most crossed over with what I was doing. So I felt like I could trust them. I didn't feel worried that something wouldn't be communicated or my position or role would be threatened in any way. It didn't feel like that. So that's a really nice thing. Sharon, you've been a, a, in a, a role that's been very male dominated. And uh, can you speak a little bit about how that's changed in your career or not? I remember the first time I went to SIGGRAPH, I think it was in the early eighties and there was probably, it felt like in this big convention, there was like 10 women. <laughs> it was like, it was just kind of shocking to me. Um, and, you know, I think things have changed a lot over the years. Yeah, maybe it's not exactly where everybody wants it to be. But from my experience, it's 
a lot more like um, in my department, the lighting department, it's probably about 30% women and it tends to stay around that level. You know, I think maybe it's slowly getting, going to be a little bit more. And a large part of that I see in my students at CalArts, we have the numbers are certainly there of women studying and, and wanting to per, pursue careers. Um, I think maybe giving them an opportunity to understand the range of, of roles that they can be pursuing is also important. Um, I see that we're going to, our time is getting a little lean here. So I want to go through some artwork and um, get your thoughts on some of this. And then we've got a few other little photos to wrap up with. So let's, uh, these are some early concepts of Buzz and Lightyear. And I understand uh, or Buzz Lightyear and Woody. And I understand Woody would have had a marionette uh, look initially. Is that correct? That yeah, was, I think that was originally. Yes, that original, was. Right? Yeah. 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 The Bud Lucky. Yeah, they did a, t a test. That's before I came, and that's what some of the stuff they used. I don't know if any. I forgot. Galen, you, Karen, did you? You didn't work on that test, did you? Or did Galen or anybody? I don't. Did I did that? not. It was a very small team. It was probably just um, John and Pete and um, maybe Evan, Andrew, and and Evan and Bill Reeves yeah. were that doing on, some DVD. of that early work. It was a great test that Woody and Buzz the original. An old version yeah. of Woody too. Oh, well, old version of both of them were on the chest and talking. Jill, this is some of your artwork, is that correct? Yeah, that was storyboard artwork. Oh, wow. Aww, so you worked in story when we slept, Jill, when you worked over in story, you, I know you said you came as an animator, but I, I have so many memories of you being in the story, but you worked in story when we stopped animation for a bit to retool the story. Is yes, that in fact, it was funny because um, the back then, again, the software was really technical. And I remember feeling like, my, my right brain and left brain really clashing um, as an animator on the original Toy Story because the software was not quite intuitive and I missed drawing. And the late, great Joe Ramp, who was the head of story on Toy Story, was a big mentor and he kept slipping me storyboards to, to either fix or redraw while my shots were rendering in animation. And so I finally got to the point where I told John, I went and flopped onto his couch and just said, you know, I miss drawing. And he said, they really want to train you in story. And um, so I switched over to the story department, not knowing anything about boarding and really got the crash course by Joe and Andrew um, back then and John and just, you know, it really changed my career um honestly uh and gave me i mean everything i know about story comes from that time really mm -hmm. it was amazing they they this is something else about the story is that they when that that transition happened um where the local team at pixar really put their foot down and said like we want to make this story ours one of the great things that happened was if you watch that movie you know john lassiter's Blue minivan is in that movie. You know, Sid, the villain that takes the toys apart was Andrew's next door neighbor growing up. I mean, there are so much of people, like Allison showed those pictures of her toys that ended up, it was such a small group. And these stories or Toy Story really was born out of stories from people who work there, which makes it even more personal. Very personal, absolutely. Uh, Bonnie, you were saying this image was pretty- uh... that's, that's a pretty, I don't, who drew, you, did you drift this, Jill? Is this your... No, I, this isn't oh, mine. This, is, this looks like, I don't know, but I'm, this is like pretty much an iconic image of what the whole premise of the movie is. Right. <laughs> right? That, 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 you know, Woody is just, you know, beside himself, that Buzz is like taking his place on the bed. That was something right. we dealt with for, you know, that was really the main premise of the, uh, the, the inciting incident of the story. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, some, it's, it's a whole array of things here. There's no real order, but uh, just the detail uh, placed within. Looks like a painting. This looks uh, like a it's painting. stunning, beautiful yeah. work. And the lighting is just gorgeous. Um, an early concept piece. Like I Ralph. don't know if this is uh, possibly Ralph's, maybe? Yeah, it looks like Ralph's. That's Ralph's, yeah. That is, yeah. And an early scene in the film that was- yeah, Somebody was saying we started on that sequence and I think we worked on it for the whole movie, didn't we, Karen? <laughs> yeah, it felt like it. But, yeah. but we would show the army man sequence and people would get really excited. I mean, that was the, that piece that you could, sh that it could stand on its own as 
these are toys that are coming to life and doing something you wouldn't expect. And so without telling anything more about beginning, middle, end of the story, you're just in love with these army men and the way they moved on the base and yeah. everything. Um, yeah, it was just great. Jill, were you in or was anybody in on the uh, board that was nailed to the shoes? Yes, Pete Doctor took an old skateboard and took the wheels off and then put shoes, nailed them or fixated them to the board. And we all had to put them on and try to walk with it as we were animating to try to figure out how your weight would shift. If you had- This looks like a Joe Ramp drawing, actually. That looks like Joe's. I think it is, Bonnie. Yeah, yeah. oh, but dear Joe. Details yeah. you guys went into to really emulate and get that, to bring breathe life into these seemingly inanimate objects. So really remarkable. And again, another really great example of the lighting within the kitchen. I forgot what set was that. I don't <laughs> think that ever made the we cut. Didn't use, we didn't, no, use, we didn't use it. So. No, we never used it. We changed. No. Lovely example. Now, Jill, I know uh, the one of these is yours for sure. A storyboard piece of Sid. Yeah, the two bottom ones um, are mine from Sid. Sid was such a fun character to board because he was, you know, the, a kid kind of that everyone knew and kind of wanted to hate. So he was just delightful to uh, to board sequences with. Now somebody threw in the mix Sid's mom. Now you have to. <laughs> I, think that came from, I think that came from a flea market or something. It is hilarious. That's funny. Was that kind of a mascot when you were working on Sid? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that painting. I've never seen that either. Oh, come on. Yeah, it was, wasn't really? it in, in uh, Ralph's office, I believe? Oh, God. Yeah. It's like something <laughs> Tia submitted. His office, I think. I think it was something that, I wish Tia was still here, but I think it ended up in Ralph's office. Yeah. There's Slinky and Bo. Oh, That's another one of mine from Bo, which uh, was funny. There was being one of the only, or the only woman in story, I got to do a lot of the, um, scenes with females in them because <laughs> a lot of times when guys draw girls they end up looking like dudes so <laughs> well she Bo Peep really stands out she uh, obviously one of the few women toy female toys there but she really I think just her design her presence her she stands well, and Galen Galen modeled her and did the shaders for her mm -hmm. and I do remember because she's porcelain how difficult that was to yeah. master, but she totally nailed it with the technology that we had back then. And the, uh, it was a labor of love for her, I, <laughs> or <yeah>. hate. <laughs> her lace elements plus the porcelain mm -hmm. and just the yeah. very textures, just remarkable. Uh, Jill, I believe these may be more of your storyboards. Yeah, I, think I, I sent in a couple, just a handful of storyboards that oh. I still had. Oh, those are great fun. And they really give you a sense of, you know, how it's taking shape, how everything is coming. Uh, these are rendered, these are rendered frames from the movie. Yeah. I think these were advertising stills. Oh, some yeah. Of them. But again, yeah. the textures on Bo Peep and, and you get this sensation of a flannel shirt for Woody and her, her lace. I guess I never really realized till I was looking at these images, just how much detail there is in each. It was very complicated. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we haven't really talked about are the model packets. Yeah. Like oh, every, everything that you see in this movie, aside from the main characters who were sculpts, there were model packets that were the most beautiful little treasure troves of artwork that was compiled to describe each and every object. And uh, I think Deidre, weren't you the keeper of all the model packets? <laughs> I had drawers of them. I had them. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. And we'd walk around to, to daily sessions, which weren't every day, but we'd have to go around and talk to the artists and we'd be referencing the model packets and what's inside. And that's how you informed uh, one of the technical directors of what what the objective was for the character, what the personality was from the character came from the textures and the, the paintings that the art department had put into these really wonderful Sharon, file, Sharon just file those? folders. Did What's you that? Use those? Did Sharon, did you use those at all for lighting reference or those are just modeling really? Usually, I mean, mostly it was for modeling and shading, but mm -hmm. occasionally we'd use them. I hope Pixar kept all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's got it in her, in her garage. <laughs> 
It is amazing. But nowadays, they're all online. I mean, then it, right. it took forever for the art department to produce these model packets. And I do remember Bill Reeves working on all the avars around Woody's mouth. You know, and those are all the them. animation controls all that allow animation. Woody to. It was, and we would review, John would sit there and review every single avar. I mean, walkthroughs took hours, but it was just, yeah, it was very detailed. But that's and the notes were all done by hand. There were no laptops to walk around. Oh, you're with. right. Oh. It was all done by hand, and Deidre had a clipboard yes. <laughs> with clipboard. reams and reams yeah. and reams of paper. Right. And it was it was a very lengthy process, very right. uh, technical and very meticulous detail. But I remember John and his relationship with the crew. He we would go into someone's office and he spend the first 20 minutes talking about all the toys on the shelf and ask the TD about their family and their kids. And finally, we would get to looking at the model and it would take an hour probably for every walkthrough. So it was eternal. But anyway, that's what it was. <laughs> that's why we couldn't get anything done. <laughs> you know, well, it took we had to light all. a fire under John eventually. Yeah. Well, and that's part of managing the artistic <laughs> efforts that everybody was putting in. It was... It was up to us to gracefully kind of control the conversation and try to get things pushed yes. through in a timely manner so that it could get on the farm. Oh, yeah. If you yeah. come to animation, I mean, walkthroughs and animation in the afternoon would sometimes be like two, two, two and a half, three hours. I remember Bonnie running down going, where is he? Why is he still <laughs> back here? But weren't, but weren't those layout turnovers like overnight? Yeah. You know, the layout turnover, yeah. the turnover to layout or something, Beasy? They were like all, they would just go all night. Basically. It was, uh, layout was horrendous. <laughs> I still have PTSD. So. <laughs> How do you invent a computer graphic camera when you don't, when you've been working in a flat 2D world your entire life is, was the biggest challenge in layout. It's like, you know, there's film language and then there's animation language and film language is quite different. And when you're in 3D, that film language really comes to play and you have to, you know, the whole team needed to learn how to make a movie that was moving, a motion picture. That was really in 3D. a trip. Mm -hmm. In 3D. Our, in 3D. Do you remember our first dailies? Like dailies room, our screening room was all thrift. It wasn't seats. Oh, the couches. The couches, those yeah. nasty couches. Nasty couches, and it was a pull-down screen. And I remember when Craig Good said, you know, we should get some better speakers for this. <laughs> making the most high-tech movie in the world and we have a pull-down screen and you know John's place uh for dailies was in a big lazy boy chair that yep. he you know lean back in and uh oftentimes you'd find old sandwiches in that couch or someone sleeping in that screening room <laughs> but I hold it very dear <laughs> one of my favorite memories of those dailies is that Lisa Frisell would always fall asleep and one day we all tiptoed out and left her sleeping in the screening <laughs> room. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that became kind of at the end, Sharon is laughing. She remembers like, we would be so tired. And basically pretty much somebody would fall asleep and the whole rest of the company would tip down out quietly, <laughs> just leave them sleeping. It's kind of funny. I said, we bought one new sofa on the pit, on the movie. And that was the one for my, I had bought a little, this little sofa for my office and I had to fight with John about it. But I was pregnant with my daughter Lily and I said, John, I'm going to be the one that has the little baby in the office. I need the sofa. I think it was like <laughs> all of like five hundred dollars or something. But that was such a big deal when we weren't spending any money. And um, anyway, I think we went through five hundred dollars worth of M and M's in one week. Oh, uh, we probably did in the end of the day. And gummy worms. Remember <laughs> and the gummy, gummy worms? worms. Oh, yeah. gummy worms. I love the gummy worms. Yeah. I did bring. I did bring one before we end up. And I know you want to show. I did. I have to show this one thing that I brought that. Um, just to sort of talk about the the closeness of this group that the, these girls, you know, I, um, Allison was my mentor in terms of being a mom for the first time because I got pregnant with my daughter Lily during the making of the movie. I remember Deirdre, um, and I think it was in, in it was Kay who was one of the other one that Ed's assistant. Yeah, yes. told me she said, "Well, no woman has ever gotten pregnant and like worked here to the baby being born." And I said, "Well, they are now." <laughs> <laughs> and then, and um, anyway, the girls threw me a baby shower when my daughter oh, was no. born. And I have this. Hold on one second. I'm going to show this 
quilt that is just historic that they made me and Deirdre quilted together. Uh, Allison taught me everything. And then Karen had her sons and um, Galen had her kids and eventually Julie and Terry and, you know, BZ already had kids. And anyway, we, we, we tried to do it all. We tried to work and be moms. And I just have to give the girls a big, you know, thank you to being so, being so great about everything. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we were probably the epitome of a very large extended family. For sure. And For sure. even still after 25 years, you know, we are, we are still family. We are all spread out all across the world, but nothing can change the fact that we all went through this together and poor BZ still has post-traumatic stress. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Reformed filmmaker. Reformed filmmaker. Yep. Um, <laughs> You know, we used to do exercise. Remember at lunch, we. Oh my God, the hills! I called Treva the taskmaster because she would force you know, run up the hills. Force me to march up those hills and back down again. And thank goodness we had a shower. You know, not together, but in, you know, in the back there was a shower. Randy, didn't you have that crew shot? Don't you have that shot of the crew, the crew picture? I the did. one in front of the swimming pool. I said that was. I thought it was at the swimming place. The plunge. Yeah. The plunge. It's the called the plunge. Fun. Yeah. Uh, production images here. So let's take a, a peek at a few of these. Yeah, that's right. That was the oh, I remember oh that. Oh my god, we got to go inside. Look how thin there. John was. Oh my god. <laughs> Tiny hair on Pete. <laughs> yeah, Pete has hair. Pete and Andrew. There's Catherine and Karen. Monica Corbin. Remember Monica? Monica Corbin. Yeah. What did she do? What was she? She was PR. Oh, okay. She was from Disney. Right, right. Wow. I think that's Tia behind her. And Heidi, Heidi Stetner. Now, was this a, a picnic gathering? Where you, Didn't we have one of those pic, the crew yeah. picnics and stuff? Yeah. yeah, yeah. we went to the park and the... Yeah. Uh, I don't remember where it was, though. I thought it was behind Pixar somewhere. Uh, no, it wasn't in Point Richmond. Why do I want to say it was more like in Berkeley or somewhere? Yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking too. Park, I went at Roberts Regional Park in Oakland, but that was the 10th anniversary picnic where, you know, that was... Wasn't that far. I thought there was a place that was over, kind of over and behind Pixar at one point. Through the tunnel, there's a park. Through the tunnel, yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Halloween, obviously, but what's going on on the right here? <laughs> <laughs> that's T and Bob, isn't it? Yeah. And that's me and Joe. And you yeah. and Joe. <laughs> Great fun. Nice Great outfit. Fun. <laughs> now was this a great I don't even remember prom. this? Was it I don't either, but I think one of the, the descriptions was that it was the prom, but I don't I don't have any recollection of this. Yeah. He is not on with her. Yeah. Is that you, Terry, in the bottom? No. Oh. No. No? That's that looks like Lisa Frisell. Yeah. Oh. Can't see it that way. That's Bill Cohn. Bill Cohn and Robin the with a blonde wig. Who's, who's <laughs> next to BC? Um, Lisa, uh, the, the guy. Robin Cooper. The guy. Robin Cooper and Bill no, Cohn. Bill Cohn's on that's the That's Bill. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and oh, <Aww. that's> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a publicity thing. Yeah. All yeah. I can think about there is how I was out of LA and didn't have my hair colorist for years. <laughs> <laughs> Oh Lord, that's so mean. Yeah. Oh, there's the crew photo. Oh, well, all the dogs. Yes. All the denim. Look at all the denim. Double yeah. denim. So some. much denim. <laughs> it's the nineties. And then didn't, didn't um and John used to go over there and go swimming sometimes, didn't he? Or a lot of the crew. I used to swim there. Yeah. Swim there. There. There's a DJ in that. Oh my God. Yeah, I think that was the day. I think Galen left immediately from this photo to go have her baby. Did she really? Uh, oh, yes, wow. she did. She got her yeah, and her last yeah. shot final. She she was in labor and she had her last shot finaled in lighting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The picture and she went. Yeah. 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 When would this would have been? This would have been in. 95 the that's 95 now. yeah because yeah. i was also i was also pregnant at the time and so yeah yeah it was like i think it was yeah. it's my or august of 95 yeah we had wrapped yeah wow amazing 
Everyone looks very happy and elated to be around. I see Jonas on the right. That's so funny. Yeah. All these people. That, yeah. There you are, Deirdre, with your hat. I love it. Wow. An amazing group. And again, to think how groundbreaking this film is and such a relatively small crew um, really putting their all towards it. A little bit of rap party fun, uh, November of 95. And of course, the great characters uh, that have still continue to warm hearts. And ladies, we are so grateful for your time and your talents and for sharing your wonderful experiences. We're deeply grateful for such an amazing panel and an incredible array of talent. Thank you for allowing us this time to share your stories and your insights and experiences on one of the landmark franchises within animation. So I'm very grateful. And on behalf of Spark Animation, want to thank you for your time. And we'll see you at the next event. Oh, it's so good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful seeing everybody. You too. Lots of love Indeed. to everyone love and everyone everybody. stay healthy out there yeah. and have a wonderful time with your families. Right. Bye. Big hugs, everybody. Big hugs to you all. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much. Be well. Bye. Bye. Bye.